Hello, everybody. It's Sil the DM, and today we're going to have a very quick video for our recap of the Sands of Calamere. Uh, session for the week of... Uh, it would have been f six days ago? November 10th or 11th, I believe it was? Um, this is going to be a very quick video, because our recap of our session should be very quick. Uh, the session is... Uh, titled, tentatively, So Who Wants to Do a Heist? And for the most part, we picked up directly where the previous session ended. Uh, however, we had some scheduling issues and some, uh, let's just say human resource issues, and we ended up starting the session about an hour late, which didn't really give us a huge amount of time to get into the thick of the things I had planned for the session. Uh, so, it was mostly a roleplay session, uh, which means we don't have too, too much to cover. There wasn't that much action. But basically, picking up where we left off previously, in the dining hall of Lord Daedric Gavelston IV, uh, the party learned after a little interaction between Lord Gavelston and his younger brother Alistair, uh, and explaining to Lord Gavelson the adventure that they had had since disappearing from the Sands of Calamere, the gate, uh, where they ended up traveling to Dakar and Kenya, uh, visiting these other worlds. After catching their friends up, and Diedrich, of this, uh, their friend, Ambar, Brazen, Froka, and Diedrich, eh, explained to the party what had been happening in Calamere since then. And they discovered unsettling news. Uh, the man who had killed Radek, that cult leader, the bald, odd figure who used weird magic and martial arts, uh, who had bested Grenier in single combat previously, uh, in Shangri Khan, was here. And it looked like that he had deep connections with the high nobility of Jaram. Uh, it was implied that many uh, dukes and duchesses are possibly under his control. And that he has an e the ear of the high czar as well. And that his cult, his followers, have been working all across the Black Sands of Jaram, digging through ancient ruins... Uh, Wasician fortresses, ancient AVX cities, digging for powerful relics and whatnot. Uh, and that was the reason that uh, Ambar and Brazen were still in Calamere. Uh, before they had left, giving up hope that their friends would return after weeks, uh, they discovered him here and decided that they were going to make a stand and try to figure out a way to interrupt his plans. Um, and through a bit of digging, Daedric discovered other specific things, like how they did attempt to reach out to his little brother, and how he shut that down very quickly. He discovered that the cultists had managed to burrow a hole, somehow, into the ancient obelisk, a titanic structure, roughly about one and a half times the, si the height of the Eiffel Tower, uh but with the mass of body of a giant pyramid made out of black sandstone. It was a heavily enchanted uh, symbol of the nation, built on the back of dwarf and AVX slaves uh, during the original coup when the Duke of Cameroon, as it was discovered or learned by the party, invaded Jaram from the north and just conquered the desert with an army of red dragons. Um, the obelisk was protected with a lot of powerful magic, fueled by the blood of the slaves that built it. Even the red dragons of the ancient world weren't able to penetrate its barriers. But somehow, a small enough entrance had been made that they were able to get people in and begin exploring. Apparently this was a very recent discovery, because they, Daedric figured that they hadn't gone in very much, so much as just finished making the opening. So the party began to develop an idea. Cl 
clearly the enemy was looking for something within this temple. And if they could get in there and figure it out first, that would be best. If they could steal whatever that person was trying to steal first, or destroy it, or remove it. Any of these things would probably serve them best. But, uh, there is the problem that that, that odd bald man, the one who had led the cultists and who had killed Radek, they also learned his name, or at least what he's going by in Jerome. They learned that it is Karen. Um, they know that if Karen discovered what was happening, most likely he would come to stop them. And beyond that, he has a Draco Lich, a resurrected dragon of possibly immense power. Something the party definitely doesn't want to deal with. So they needed to figure out a way to keep him occupied and unaware of what they were doing and tried to be as stealthy as possible when infiltrating the obelisk. And so it came to the decision to split the party. Karen is working all of the social circles, trying to get as many powerful dukes and duchesses under his control as possible to give his men free access to their, not only their ancient ruins that might be within their countries, but also just access to the lives of their followers. They're the people those dukes and duchesses are supposed to protect. As you could remember from Shangri Khan, where he had been sacrificing citizens and people captured out of the sands. Very clearly, whatever he's doing is taking a lot of people. A lot of death. So the party decided, uh, with the aid of Magnus who they're beginning to discover has more political power here than one of the dukes, which is, outside of the emperor, possibly the highest sort of default political rank one could have within the empire. Like, you're the emperor, and directly under him are a few specifically named uh, titles, special individuals, uh, and then beyond them, you have the dukes. Uh, and... Duke, Lord Gavelston IV, uh, defers to Magnus as if he's a political superior, and the party's beginning to recognize that their traveling companion might be a lot more well-off than just a fairly well-off dwarf-centric, uh, which is sort of what they thought he was. He, they've, he's never hidden the fact that he was from a very powerful or wealthy family, but I don't believe the party really understood how wealthy or how well off, and it's beginning to dawn on them that he might be in a league beyond them. Magnus suggested that they could attend one of the High Tsar's dinner parties, something that's usually hosted once or twice a week during the summer months, when so many of the dukes and duchesses are residing in the capital, a way for people to uh, interact, foster trade routes, air grievances, and interact with one another without needing to resort to a battlefield. The High Tsar himself very rarely attends these dinners, but Karn attends all of them, hoping to foster more political power and gain control of more resources. Uh, so it was decided that two of the party members would go with Magnus to serve as his bodyguards so that they could keep Karn distracted and try to figure out exactly what Dukes and Duchesses Karn has control over. While this, the other four members of the party would infiltrate the obelisk. During all of this, Blair was going through a very hard time with her many levels of exhaustion and her one attempt to interact with the party during their conversations of this being stopped when Riok, the cleric, uh, used command to tell her to rest, putting her to sleep, uh, which she was very not happy about. And during her sleep, she was visited by Ardenfell, uh, Aesir's adopted father, the bronze dragon. He, they've been having odd conversations since Ardy, as the players like to call him, uh, have begun to appear before Aesir while on Dakar. And for some reason, Blair seems able to see him 
just as clearly as Acer can sometimes, and hear him especially. He explained to her that in some ways her resting would be the help they need, and reminisced about times in his youth when he would push himself past the break of exhaustion, and how it often almost resulted in the death of his friends. And Blair felt that she understood where he was coming from, at least. But she was still very mad and hurt that Ryok would use magic on her to influence what she was doing. Especially with the whole feeling that there was some sort of magical mental lock on her head. It has her feeling very vulnerable to that sort of magic, and she was very upset. Uh, as everyone got ready for the infiltration and the party mission, prepping for their heist, uh, Blair did eventually wake up and get caught up on what was happening. Uh, and she was ready to infiltrate the obelisk, but she was still very put out with Ryok. While Aesir and Kirin, the two Kitsune, uh, bathed and were dressed in fine, uh, silk nobleman's clothes made of giant spider silk that is apparently, uh, quite beautiful and hard to use or work with, but very, very fine. And the two parties set off on their separate ways. There were a few other individual moments of roleplay, such as between Ryok and Brazen, but uh, where he was discussing his connection that he had made on Dakar with the Littlest Murder, a raven spirit from, again, this distant world. But beyond that, and a little reassurance that Ramza, the deity that Ryok uh, worships and is a priest of, would not be jealous or angry with the young cleric if he found something else to also have a connection with. Uh, the party was, for the most part, ready to go uh, and do this little Ocean's Eleven style heist where two of the members of the party were going to be running distraction at the dinner, keeping Cairn from knowing what was going on while the rest infiltrated the obelisk. And unfortunately, due to time, that's where we left off. So hopefully in the next session we'll have a... We'll, we will definitely be going quicker uh, and trying to get into more action and uh, role play and just get a little bit more done. I want to thank you for listening to this video. If you have any questions, comments, or inquiries about the setting or the campaign, please leave it in the comments below.